Hi, Ozzy here. An often repeated claim by some religious apologists is that atheism is responsible for more murderous atrocities than theism. Atheism, they maintain, is so morally bankrupt that an atheistic society or culture can easily end in genocides and mass murders, such as those that were conducted under regimes such as Joseph Stalin, and Chairman Mao, or Pol Pot. Uh, the claim is also sometimes presented as, a, as a, a way of countering the charge that theism is responsible for all manner of atrocities carried out in the name of religion in the form of heresy hunting, witch burnings, crusades, religious wars, etc. Now, this is an argument that makes me cringe every time I hear it. Uh, whether it's put forward by theists trying to damn atheists or when atheists use it to defame any and all religions. In the course of my life, I've noticed a change in how this argument is marshaled by theists. Years ago, I seldom heard this allegation initiated by theists. It was usually atheists, in criticizing theists, who fired these opening salvos using this argument, alleging that Christianity, for example, could hardly lay claim to being a moral force in the world because of Christianity's long history of atrocities in the very name of Christianity. And it seems to me that most of the time, it was usually only after atheists had lobbed this moralizing bucket of tar at a theist that, that the theist would counter by turning the tables and pointing to the unimaginably high body counts amassed by murderous totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, most of which were avowedly atheistic, and some of which made a point of persecuting religiosity and the religious people trapped within their territorial boundaries. But over the last decade or two, I've noticed a change in this pattern. It seems to me, and, and this is just a, a vague impression I have, but the religious have increasingly gone on the offensive with this allegation. Uh, it seems to me that recently, in any exchange between theists and atheists on the question of the impact of religiosity on morality, I now find that it's the theists um, who are doing this. They're no longer just resorting to this allegation in response to the charge from atheists, but rather they're taking the initiative and trotting out this claim almost immediately when the subject of morality arises within a discussion about a God's existence. It's, it's like it's become the the argument of choice, the go-to argument for the theist against the atheist when discussing the connection between morality and religiosity or atheism. Now the reason I dislike this argument, whichever side it's coming from, is because it almost always betrays a deep confusion about the terms theist and atheist uh, and the implications of the, of the connections between those two things and human action. The words theism and atheism are not the names of worldviews. They are not even philosophical positions or moral positions. People say all the time, a theistic worldview, an atheistic worldview. That to me is all wrong. Theism and atheism are just broad catch-all categories on the question of whether God or gods exist or not. Now, does it make any sense, ask yourself, does it make any sense to say of a Reformed Protestant that she shares the same worldview as a fundamentalist Muslim just because both of their beliefs fall under the more general heading of Abrahamic religions? Would it make sense to insist that Christians and Muslims and Jews have the same worldview as a monotheist of a non-Abrahamic faith just because they're all monotheists? Or how about the polytheistic would it make sense to say that a polytheistic Hindu and an ancient worshipper of the Olympian gods of Greece share a worldview? Worse still, should believers in all the religions I just mentioned be described as belonging to one worldview because all of these different religions and perspectives can be subsumed under the umbrella word theism? Obviously not. The terms theism and atheism are merely terms that cleave all worldviews into two types. Those worldviews that include a God in their ontology and those that do not. 
Theism is a term that cuts right across people of wildly different beliefs. And consequently, the concept of theism provides us virtually no predictive leverage on what a theist will do and no explanatory purchase on why a specific person or population of believers in a specific faith did what they did, be it good or bad or neither. To say that someone is a theist is to say virtually nothing about that person's worldview or belief set. Now similarly, atheism is a broad catch-all term that includes everything from secular humanist to a Randian objectivist to Orthodox Marxist Leninism, along with any other unspecified worldview that doesn't include any sort of God or gods within its ontology. Some of these atheistic worldviews are positively anti-theistic, um, such as the philosophy of Ayn Rand or objectivism, um, and uh, Orthodox Marxism, for instance, while others are not hostile to theistic beliefs. Now my reason for stressing the fact that the labels theist and atheist are broad category terms as opposed to the names of specific worldviews is to call attention to how far removed those labels are from the specific beliefs which are in fact causally consequential with respect to what people value, what they want, what they're prepared to do, and how they'll treat others. It should be obvious that it is the specific beliefs one holds which animate us to value what we do and act in the ways that we do. Our actual specific beliefs govern our conduct. So if we want to trace historical atrocities back to beliefs that motivated them, we need to be talking about specific beliefs, not some larger umbrella term under which we happen to fall. Consider a contemporary example. We are, by now, all very much aware that fundamentalist Islam contains within it certain beliefs that furnish enough of a motivation rationale for some people who take those beliefs very seriously to kill themselves in the service of those beliefs. Now, while fundamentalist Islam is an Abrahamic religion, and the Abrahamic religions are monotheistic, and monotheism is a species of theism, it would make no sense to say that monotheism or theism leads to honor killing and suicide bombings. To make such a claim would be to ignore what is relevant to correctly predicting and explaining honor killings and suicide bombings. When it comes to evaluating the likely behavioral consequences of believing in one worldview over another, we have to look at actual worldviews, not broad dichotomous categories. For the reasons I've mentioned already, neither theists nor atheists are worldviews, but rather they're catch-all categories, a way to divide up everyone on earth into two mutually exclusive classes, the very broadest and vaguest level of generality. Now, by contrast, fundamentalist Islam could be arguably be described as a worldview, as could be high Anglicanism, Leninism, Buddhism, Sartrean existentialism, uh, an organized secular humanism. And one's worldview doesn't have to have a name at all. Uh, a huge and growing number of people in the world don't explicitly subscribe to any specifiable religious creed or philosophical school. Such people aren't lacking a worldview merely because they lack a convenient name for whatever beliefs they hold. They just have an implicit worldview. Now, the more we know about a group's actual worldview, the better from the standpoint of understanding why they did what they did and predicting what they might do in the future. The richer our picture of what they believe, the better we can connect the dots between what they believe and how they behave or are likely to behave under various circumstances. But we don't need to know in exhaustive detail all of a person's beliefs, obviously, to make useful and meaningful predictions of how they will conduct themselves under specific conditions. It's sufficient to know some subset of people's core beliefs to produce rough and ready inferences about the behavioral consequences of believing as they do. So for instance, you would need to know which specific denomination of Christianity a person belongs to in order to infer that a self-described Christian regards the New Testament as a, an extremely important source of moral wisdom. That would be a pretty safe bet. 
labels such as Christian, Muslim, liberal, uh, progressive, communist, libertarian, they usually capture enough about what a person believes that we can make some reliable predictions about what they're likely to, be, to believe and therefore what some of their behavioral dispositions are going to be. If beliefs are going to be invoked as an explanatory factor in human actions, which they surely must be, we have to make sure that the beliefs we're invoking have a fairly high degree of specificity. They have to be more than mere suitcase terms like theism and atheism, which include completely incompatible sets of beliefs with completely different behavioral consequences. To help see the force of this helps to consider truly pacifistic religions such as Jainism and Amish Christians, both of which are also forms of theism. The Jains and Amish Christians stand as disconfirming cases for anyone claiming that theism, the mere belief in a god, leaves one more likely to commit atrocities. These two varieties of theism, one a, a religion of Indian origin and the other a, a species of uh, Christian Anabaptists, have wildly different core beliefs and they stress different aspects than say fundamentalist Islam or medieval Catholicism or contemporary forms of Protestantism. Now, it's surely not impossible to imagine circumstances under which Jains and Amish Christians might take to killing others to further their religions, but that would necessitate that those religions dramatically overhaul their dogmas and which moral principles they want to emphasize. Because theism is a general term which covers many different things, similar to the way terms like sport and art are general terms that encompass very varied human activities. We can't simply attribute a tendency to violence, torture, and mass murder to theism. To say of a person that he is a theist is to say almost nothing about what he or she is likely to do and what his or her attitudes are likely to be. For the same reason, it's every bit as false and unfair to imply that all, or even most atheists, are as hostile and deranged in their hatred of religion as Stalinists were, as it is to say that Jains and Buddhists are as murderous as medieval Christian witch burners or present-day jihadis. My point here is not merely that people are overgeneralizing when they connect theism or atheism to some atrocity, but rather that the terms theism and atheism do not name or even describe worldviews at all. What's more, they don't even name one specific belief that translates into worrisome action. Ask yourself, why exactly did European Christians of generations past torture and kill heretics across the continent for centuries? The answer lies in part in what they believed. Given the worldview of a medieval Christian, heresy is the most dangerous human activity imaginable. The words and actions of a heretic, should they come to be believed by others, can turn the saved into the damned. As uh, Sam Harris has vividly pointed out, the heretic in your hometown is far more dangerous to your children than the child molester next door. The child molester can merely damage your child physically and psychologically in this life, a temporary condition. But the heretic can, merely by his words, cause your child to be separated from you for all eternity, condemned to suffer in conscious eternal torment, a literal infinity of misery. It's not hard to understand, given what Christians fervently believed about the fate of immortal souls and divine wrath, why they were so murderous towards heretics in light of what they specifically believed, their murderous actions are perfectly unsurprising, even predictable. In the same way, it takes no great feat of imagination to understand what motivates the jihadi to blow himself up, uh, or to appreciate why his friends and family might even celebrate his martyrdom. Specific beliefs matter. What we believe specifically is very much determinative of what specific actions we undertake and how we respond to events around us, including threats, real or imagined. By parity of reasoning, one can also understand how specific beliefs of leaders of various communist regimes in history 
motivated them to enslave and exterminate any and all whom they regarded as standing in the path of the glorious communist future they imagined, which promised complete freedom from all forms of economic oppression and class struggle, and would thereby bring about equality and permit people to flourish without having to prostitute their labor to avaricious and exploitative capitalists. Given the incredible things those communists believed about history as a dialectical process, about the nature of economics, of the mutability of human psychology and the plasticity of human nature, and the moral turpitude of capitalists, their murderous actions make sense. The stakes, as they saw them, were simply high enough to justify horrifying actions in the name of the revolution. An enduring utopia was just there to be had. It was just one bloody and merciless revolution away. The common point in these examples is that it was specific, irrational dogmas which were operative here. Preposterous beliefs are what inspired, motivated, and justified the commission of acts of breathtaking evil inflicted upon as many people as they could manage at the time. One can only imagine how much more the enormity of Christian heresy hunters would have been had they had railways and modern bureaucracy and gas chambers at their disposal. What would Hitler and Stalin have done if they'd had atomic weaponry? The scale of these moral catastrophes was limited only by the technologies of the day. But their causes were doxastic. That is, it was what they believed to be the case, and more exactly, how many preposterous things they positively believed, and how confidently they believed these preposterous things. The devil reigns where reason goes on holiday. It was not a mere belief in God which was responsible for witch hunts and inquisitions. Much more must be swallowed before one will burn a person at the stake for the imaginary crime of witchcraft. Similarly, there's no sense in which believing there's no God is responsible for gulags and political purges. Much more needs to be believed to motivate that. So for these reasons, all those who try to connect atrocities to the terms theist and atheist are, in my view, ignoring all the relevant facts which actually connect what a person believes with the actions to which those beliefs are apt to lead. Whenever I had the opportunity of pointing this out to atheists who allege that a belief in God was the slippery slope to inquisitions, I have generally had success after some long arguments in convincing them that the object of their accusation should never be merely theism. Regrettably, whenever I have presented this argument to Christians and Muslims and other theists who were tossing this tar bucket at atheists, I've had very little success in getting them to recognize the fallacy of attributing atrocities occasioned by complex sets of very specific beliefs to mere atheism. With only a few exceptions, every religious person with whom I have argued this point has seemed content to hold fast to the simplistic allegation that atheism is responsible for these 20th century genocides. They find it difficult to get beyond the idea that because atheism was a common denominator in these 20th century atrocities, that atheism itself, the mere belief that no God exists, is the correct explanation for those atrocities. And almost without exception, when I press them for their reasons for insisting that it's the lack of a belief in any deity that best explains these 20th century atrocities, they argue that morality is without foundation unless there's a God. Atheism, they maintain, leaves us morally rudderless. Atheists are not intrinsically worse than anyone else, they argue, but without a belief in a God, a, a people will be unable to formulate convincing reasons to believe in robust and durable moral principles. For this reason, anyone who does not believe in a god is less likely to hold fast to rules of conduct that would otherwise restrict him or her from committing atrocities. As they're fond of repeating, if there's no god, everything is permitted. 
This, I submit, is just not a realistic analysis of totalitarian regimes and atrocities. If it were the case, shouldn't one expect Mao's post-revolutionary China to be filled with sexual libertines and sexual freedoms? What do we actually find there, even today? China is arguably the most sexually repressed and sexually ignorant population in the world. Under Chinese communism, human sexuality has, for generations now, been brutally repressed in ways that even a proverbially pinched and prudish church lady or a shrouded Muslim woman would find excessive. This is one of the inhumane aspects of Chinese communism that gets very little mention from apologists. The imposition of rigid puritanical rules and highly punitive, punitive consequences for such things as premarital sex, extramarital sex, marital infidelity, homosexuality, masturbation, along with other demands of sexual self-restraint, are all rather difficult to reconcile with the idea that not believing in a god will result in a society that is permissive in its sexual mores. Doesn't quite fit, does it? Shouldn't such regimes be bastions of permissiveness and lawlessness? I submit that widespread atheism is no more likely to result in permissiveness or totalitarianism than widespread theism is likely to result in a population of saints or ritual cannibals. In order to understand such phenomena as pogroms and purges and censorship and dehumanizing repression of basic biological impulses, one has to consider the specific beliefs that moved the leaders of these regimes to think such measures were necessary. The failure to believe in a god or gods simply does not explain any of the facts, just as the concept of theism doesn't explain the enormous range of good and evils done where religions hold sway. So where does this leave us? When theists and atheists lob this bucket of tar back and forth at one another, is one side making a more legitimate case than the other? I don't think so. If an apologist for secular humanism, for instance, claims that theism is responsible for atrocities when he's addressing a devout Amish Christian, then that secular humanist is ignoring what is probably a living counterexample before his eyes. I think that such a charge can only be made by ignoring the specific content of the other person's beliefs. The worldview of the Amish Christian is a belief set characterized by a strong emphasis on forgiveness and an abhorrence of violence which leaves him more likely to be the persecuted than the persecutor. Now imagine a different case wherein a theist this time is charging that atheism leads to moral atrocities. Imagine that the accuser in this mudslinging contest happens to be a devout evangelical Christian who's fond of emphasizing ancient dogmas about hell and the perils of disbelieving in his God, someone who actively exerts political pressure on elected officials to legislate worship of his God in public institutions and who fulminates against non-believers. Imagine further that this particular um, theist is arguing with an atheist opponent who is a bleeding heart liberal, a secular humanist, a committed vegan and pacifist. For such a theist to suggest that that atheist is more prone than himself to behave like Joseph, Joseph Stalin, merely because he thinks there's no God, betrays a deep confusion about what makes people do what they do. My central claim has been that neither atheism nor theism can be used to explain or account for past and present human atrocities. And this is because both these terms are catch-all terms that divide all people into one class or the other by specifying the presence or absence of a certain type of belief at a very high level of generality. Theism and atheism are just too abstract, too general, too imprecise, and so are unsuitable as explanatory candidates in any analysis of what makes people commit atrocities. One must believe so much more. So long as we're interested in how the ideas people have leads them into mischief, the proper objects of analysis 
must necessarily be the specific beliefs that serve to motivate people into such mischief. So as I see it, this means we should not point to some moral catastrophe from the history books and attribute it to the fact that those responsible believed there was a God or not. The propositions, there is a God and there is no God, are not even candidates for moving people to evil, or good for that matter. But specific religious and political beliefs are. If you're going to condemn a belief on the basis of some atrocity, it better be a belief sufficient to motivate those actions. Specific beliefs matter. Nobody ever helped or hurt another person merely because of their theism or atheism. Okay, that's all for now, and thank you for watching.